If you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to a very familiar verses of Scripture. Brother Jarrett mentioned it, but we're not going to really focus on what is usually focused on in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Um, continue to remember all those that have been mentioned for prayer, for churches without pastors, uh, and that the Lord would be lifted up in that. Uh, John chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. John chapter 3, in the first verse, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a, more, a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? <laughs> Jesus answered, <coughs> Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it, com it cometh or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that, that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our wit and receive not our witnesses, our witness, excuse me, and if a man told if and if I have told you earth, of earth and if if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We pray this morning that you would allow us to uh, focus on heavenly things this morning and not on earthly things. And if you'd give us that power, we give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name that we do pray, amen. Now this morning we're going to be looking at heavenly things, that uh, things that heaven consists of, things that uh, we've heard spoken of all of our lives, the things that are in heaven in the very abode of God. Uh, now let me say before we review just some of these verses, uh, we don't know a lot about heaven. If you study the, the Bible throughout, what you'll find uh, is that he speaks equally among, uh, among the, uh, or speaking of the, uh, of the stars and the planets as he does the abode of God. Uh, so one thing that we know about the abode of God is that we don't know it all yet, but we shall. Uh, there's a, a coming a day when we will know about heaven in and of itself. Secondly, I can assure you, heaven is where you ought to desire to be. But with that said, no man desires heaven in and of himself. That, 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 that comes from the Almighty. Now, you might uh, desire in yourself an escape from hell, but that's far different than desiring the things of heaven. And we're going to look at those things today and focus on what heaven will be for us. And Brother Jarrett already mentioned this man uh, named Nicodemus that approached Christ uh, during his early ministry and was amazed by what Christ had to say. Now, first of all, I want you to see that Nicodemus, in verse 1, the Bible says he was a Pharisee. Now, that's integral because the Pharisees believed in the next life, and Sadducees didn't. 
uh, Sadducees were Jews, but they thought when you, you got popped in the ground, that was it. That, that there was nothing more uh, to be said. So we do know this, that Nicodemus believed in uh, a life after this one, and he believed it so much that he approached the Lord Jesus about it. So we, we know that's been a teaching from the very beginning that there is a place that is abode, the abode of God where he is and even as we speak and where he abides, and I'll say, most of the time. Now, I want you to see that the things of heaven, even the teachings of heaven, are above our thought processes. Now, what we do know about heaven is minuscule or small, and what's big and glorious about heaven, this mind here can barely take. It can only take a smidgen of one of the good things that lie forward in, in the place of God. Now, so with that said, he begins to describe how to get there. What is the approach? You must be born again. That is the only way. Not baptism, not church membership, not repeating a prayer, simply being born again. And I've told this church thousands of times in my ministry, you contributed nothing to your birth. That was the actions of your mother and father. You didn't have a question about when. You didn't have a question about why. Uh, why all their actions created a living being. That's exactly how God creates us spiritually. It's his business. It's what he does. It has nothing to do whatsoever with you. So uh, Nicodemus being a good religious Pharisee, his only response was this, how can this be? I know all about the Jewish law. How can it come down to this? It was so amazing to him that, uh, as Jared said, can I go a second time into my mother's womb? He didn't get it. He was thinking about carnal things. But then the Lord made it clear to him that which is born of spirit is spirit and that which is born of flesh is flesh. Now, everyone under the sound of my voice this morning has been born to the flesh because you're a cognitive person that's aware of what's going around you. But I dare say not everyone in this room has been born to the Spirit. And you need that more desperately than you know. And that's what Nicodemus, or excuse me, the Lord told Nicodemus. Now, again, Nicodemus, no doubt considering himself a spiritual man, and he says, how can these things be? And what was the Lord's question? Are thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Have you ever read the Bible verse that says, uh, uh, he who knoweth much, much is required you know what, church? You know a whole lot of things. All you people have grown up in the Bible Belt. You know and uh, know of the person of God, and that makes you hugely responsible to him. So here was Nicodemus with all this grand knowledge, and he says, you're a master, you're a teacher in Israel, and you don't know something that's so simple as the spiritual things of God? You think that's probably a lot of where we're at today is not knowing really spiritually what's going on and, and not being aware uh, of, the, uh, of the spiritual things that are around us. And, and so he makes this statement to Nicodemus. Now, lastly, I want you to see in verse 11, the Lord says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, I say unto thee, excuse me, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witnesses. Now, I want you to see again, he says all this stuff 
I'm telling you, I've seen with my own eyes. In fact, I've created it. I, I know what the spiritual realm is about. And then lastly, in verse 12, if I've told you earthly things and you believe it not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So we, we find two very real things there. There is a distinct difference between earthly things and heavenly things. Now you think about all that you see, especially this time of year, things budding out and greening out and the beauty uh, that we see. And, and you know, we think we have knowledge, don't we? But is there any way to describe and any way to capture really what makes a, a tree bud out and, one, and ones that don't? Is there any way to, to truly describe the beauty of a fruit tree when it puts forth or blooms? And, and I dare say there's not. There's nothing that can be said that, uh, be said of that that fully describes it. And here we find the Lord Jesus said, that's just earthly things. That's just things that you see every day. That's the, just the things of the routine. But I'm going to tell you about spiritual things. I'm going to tell you about heavenly things. Now, you think about what a wonderful thing heaven must be. The, the abode of God where we're going to live with him. How, how wonderful, how peaceful, how glorious. It has to be akin to Eden. It has to be something like, like where there were no sin. Uh, we know there's no sin there. Uh, and, and we can't capture that. We can't understand a place where sin is not always a threat to God's people, but in heaven... We will understand that more and more and more. Now, go with me back to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8. Now, uh, this desire of heaven, this knowledge of uh, heaven is practically as old as the word of God itself. 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8. And uh, we're going to read just verse 27 for uh, time's sake. But, God, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. Now, they were really talking of the temple. They were talking about what they had just completed for the worship of God to, to occur in. And he begins to speak concerning the very God that abides there. And the question was, can I build him a house that could contain him? And the answer is an emphatic no. Can the earth contain the person of God? And again, the answer is an emphatic no. And then notice the wording in your Bible. It says the heaven of heaven of heavens cannot contain who he is. Now, the heaven, there are three heavens, and you'll find that in the Bible. There's the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. The first heaven, look out today, we've got partly cloudy skies. That's your first heaven. Above that is the second heaven. Everybody's all been out of shape about uh, uh, the eclipse tomorrow. You know what that is? That's the second heaven. And you know what's beyond that? The abode of God, the third heaven. Now, if I understand this scripture here, even in that day, they fully understood that he couldn't be contained. God is not contained to the third heaven. He abides there. But if he wants to be here, he can be here. And if he wants to be across the skies, he can be across the skies because you cannot contain God. So we find one thing about the third heaven that is endless. 
Do you ever think about when we're called up to be with the Lord in the air and, and, and we're there forever and ever? It's already been established. And our minds can't comprehend how long ago or <laughs> it just was and, 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 and what's involved in that. And we're going to be there and then that's going to be here. What a glorious, glorious thing. That's the abode of God. We need to have an internal desire. So the first thing that we can understand and know is this, that it's forever. That, that, that's a wonderful truth about heaven. It's forever. It will go on and on and on and has been and has been and has been and it always will be. You know what? Our little house is here. They'll come and go and one day somebody will run by and, and there'll be nothing there anymore. But not the abode of God. It's forever and ever and ever. It's secure. As secure as your salvation, the abode of God is strong. Uh, we see things fall apart here, but not there. Uh, it's an everlasting to everlasting. That is the abode of God. Job chapter 16. Now, Job... Uh, had a rough time of it. And he had some friends that pointed out his issues. But I want you to see that what Job's understanding was. Job, Job 16, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Job 16 and verse 14. And again, remember they, the his friends had been some somewhat critical of the way that he had handled the situation with his children and his own life. Uh, and so Job 16, beginning in verse 14, the Bible says he, now this is Job speaking, and that he in the sentence, he's speaking of God. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth up upon me like a giant. Now, can you imagine speaking that of our gracious Redeemer, the very God of the Bible, saying, this is how he treats me. Now, you know, if you look at Job's life, Job was entirely an error over that. He lost 10 children in one day and all his wealth in a matter of minutes. And he says, he, he, he has really beat me up lately but he still considered, considered him God. See, we live in a day and age and if, if it, it's not good things happening, uh, it, it's the devil and not God. Don't ever fool yourself into believing that. You know what? Uh, sometimes, just like with our children, we have to discipline them, do we not? If they belong to you and you don't do discipline them, you've done yourself, a, you've done them a great injustice. And, and, and so we find here that Job is somewhat sad and, and somewhat upset, saying, "Yes, God has really, uh, really whipped me lately." Verse fifteen: uh, I have sold sackcloth upon my skin. Now, get that verse, understand it. I have sold sackcloth to my skin, not just made an outfit out of it. It's a black outfit that they would use for grief. He said, I sold it to my skin. That's how grieved I am. That's how down and out I am. That's how I'm upset over this judgment I am in. I have sold the black stuff right directly to my skin. Verse 16, my face is foul and weeping, and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Now, uh, the, the face, my face is found weeping, uh, upset, broken down, uh, grieving over the situation that, that, that he's in. Verse 17. Not for any justice in my hands, also in prayer is pure. 
not for any injustice in my hands. Now, you get that, and, and I used to be pretty good about beating up on Job and how he treated his children, but I want you to see, it says here, not for any injustice. That means I haven't violated the law. That means I haven't, I haven't sinned in this sense. And he says, and, and he says with that, judgment still came. You know what? You don't have to be an outright <laughs> filthy person. You can be right on point and, and, and receive the judgment of God. And you know why? He wants to show people, even though he's in full judgment, he's not going to deny me. And you know what? Job didn't. He, he did not deny him. He stood with him when, when all his friends said, throw in the towel, Job, it's over with. The second part of verse 17. Also, my prayer is pure. Now, if you underline in your Bible, underline that one, and you can question yourself, and you can ask within it yourself, is your prayer pure? Now, uh, you know what? Uh, Job was making that claim on this despite all the circumstance that was happening around him. He was praying a pure prayer. He did not say, God, this is your fault. I can't stand you anymore. He prayed a pure prayer. He still give God the praise. Verse 18. O earth, O earth, cover not thou my blood, and let my cry have no place. In other words, he wanted to be well seen what he was enduring. And also, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. So we find two more things that are in heaven. God is in heaven. <laughs> Your witness is in heaven, and your records in heaven. Now, the, the first one, a witness, and, and y'all know how courtrooms work, and someone comes before you, and they swear in a witness, they have to be in a situation, I saw the crime, and I saw her do it. Right? That's a witness. Or I was there, and he had nothing to do with it. That's a witness, right? Someone that actually saw it. Now, the glorious, wonderful thing, listen, you're not your own witness on high. Christ is your witness. Christ is the one that say, he's mine. I give my life for him. He's not much, but he belongs to me. And you know what? His father, the judge, is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in into the joys of the Lord. Because, see, we have witness. You know, though, you that are lost, what you don't have, you don't have a witness. Well, you have one, you don't want it. <coughs> Remember the accuser. That's one of Satan's names, is the accuser. He's a witness, isn't he? He's a lying witness, but he's a witness. Now, notice, in addition to the witness that's going to be there in heaven, there's a record. Now, is this a, a, a look at your record? I don't know. I've done some pretty disastrous, sickening things in my life that I would nobody know about, right? Does that record still exist? I don't think so. <coughs> uh, I think it's under the blood. So what is this record? Well, well, what does it consist of? I personally need it to be the Lamb's Book of Life. And you know, I have the wisdom of God and His by His grace and mercy before eternity began. He wrote my name in the book. There's no description. There's no reason. There's no sense that you can make out of it. I just know that He did. And that is the record. It's in heaven. Now, 
that you need to make your knees come together or if give you can cause you to give great glory and honor to God. Because listen, I'm glad that it doesn't make me nervous that there's a record there. It makes me glad and happy that a record exists. Now, some of y'all, almost half the group is homeschoolers and half of us went to the public school. But, uh, you know, uh, way, way back, <laughs> you... Your parents didn't run to the schoolhouse with you. you. You went down there on your own. And I remember the first time I was in kindergarten and they created a, a role for, for, the, for the school year. And they'd say, what's your name? And I'd say, Larry Lavery. And he was, they would say, are you James Dale's brother? And my first response is, why do you want to know? <laughs> and, uh, but you see, there was a record there. It was got from different sources, and they put your name, and then they'd alphabetize them, and they'd start calling the roll. But see, it wasn't made until we got there, was it? <laughs> this one was made in eternity past. Before there was, remember, uh, remember uh, what Moses told him to tell the uh, the Pharaoh before before there was I am <laughs> that's how old that record is and so we find now that we have at least three items in heaven that we can glorify God for God Himself is going to be there this record book is going to be here uh, be there and a witness Christ is going to be there on our behalf what what could be better that's enough to glorify God for in and there alone and we should lift him up Isaiah uh, Isaiah 14 very familiar verse of scriptures but I thought this was as enchanting about heaven as the stuff that's going to be there it's this one item that's not going to be there. Isaiah 14 in verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Satan's not going to be there. Now, I don't know exactly when this happens or if this ability can still happen, but we just read in the book of Job, and how does that, how does that event begin? Do you remember? It says, and there was a day when the sons of men appeared before uh, God, and Satan was also among them. Uh, number one, and first and foremost, he, he's still under God. And if uh, God says, Satan, I want you to jump, his only response was, how high do you want me to jump? Right? Because when they had this, and, and these sons came in, he says, Satan, where have you been? I've been in the earth, walking up and down and through it. I don't know if he still has that ability or not. I don't know when this event that Isaiah was allowed to record for us exactly happened, but it said he was thrown to the earth. And he, we, know, we know he was there when Adam and Eve was on the scene, all right? And I know he was here this morning because he, he worried me before I got ready for church, right? So I don't know if he still has this ability to go back unto God but I do know this, he won't be there again. Can you imagine such a time when you get to glory that you never have to have that worry ever again? That's heaven. That's glorious. Uh, th th that's a glorious, wonderful time just to think, hey, He's no longer be after me. He's no longer to be worrying me. He's going to know ever, ever again when he calls me to doubt the word of God. He's not going to do it. You know what? That sounds like heaven to me. That, that, sounds, uh, that sounds glorious. That sounds wonderful. The mission piece that we've dealt with since time began is no longer going to worry us ever, ever, ever again. 
That's heaven. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9. And you masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing and threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respect of persons with him. Now, we find two more things about heaven. First of all, the master's going to be there. Now, Nicodemus didn't quite mean it like we mean it when he says, Master, we know that our teacher come from God. Now, what he meant was like having a master's degree really in Jewish history. Now, we all know that Jesus did not have that. He created Jew Jewish history. He didn't need to study it, all right? And, but that's how they took him. He was so knowledgeable of the Word of God that they thought he had studied it somehow. And, but here, this master that's going to be in heaven, that is Christ, is a master like a slave master, like ownership, like he called us. Now, uh, in the modern-day culture, everybody hates slavery but see, the reality of, of this in slavery was that, especially toward the end as the war between the states approached, at least in our country, you know that there were standards of slavery? You see the vicious whippings on TV shows, and I'm sure that they did occur. But do you know that they had to have so many hours off, they had to have so much food every day, they had to have a clean place to live. They had to have ability to keep fires and be warm. All that was a necessity. And you know what? If, if, if you didn't do that, you know what happened? You lost your slaves. And you think about the security that we have in Christ. And by that I mean spiritual, spiritual security. People often will say, well, we'll never, we'll never go hungry because God said that. Well, you better read that verse again because he was talking to spiritual things. You know, people who, who defend the stuff we believe as little as 200 years ago died for it. But we do have a master, do we not? He's going to provide for us. We, we may die in the flesh, but he'll provide with us in glory. Everything we... Now think about this, man. We're the ones that has to bust our chops every day, right? Never having to get up and going to work again. Sometimes, you know, I wake up, and at 55, it's becoming more frequent. I'm like, uh, I don't think I can do this. And then I hear Donna in there tinkering around in the kitchen. I'm like, well, I better get up. And then I hear Bella, Bella running her mouth, and I'm like, well, she's got to eat today. And then I see Sarah sneaking out to go to school. And I think all those reasons, I've got to get up and do it one more time. Right? And I did. Can you imagine all that under the goodness of God being taken care of and not having to get up? <laughs> not so bad to have a master, is it? Uh, not so bad having someone to ensure you have every item you need. That is glory and the things that are there. In other words, when we get to glory, there's no working. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Me and Matthew David sometimes had a, a little headbutt on this, and he said, oh yeah, we're going to be working. And I said, well, I don't see that from the Word of God. And what, But he's talking about the kingdom years, and I don't even think we're going to be working in the kingdom years. We'll have responsibilities but working like the back-breaking work that we do now, not going to happen. But I want you to see that everything you possibly could need spiritually. You ever study and study and study <coughs> the Word of God and not get nothing out of it? Uh. It will never happen again. Uh. Never. We'll, we'll, we'll 
Bible, we'll see the juiciest of the most precious scriptures in a brand new way that will give us food for our eternity. That is coming. That is on its way. That is near and nigh unto us. 2 Corinthians. Very familiar verses of scripture. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Last thing we're going to look at, certainly not an inclusive list, but the last thing we're going to look at is going to be in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5 in the first verse. 2 Corinthians 5 in the first verse. The Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, another thing that's not going to be there, at least the way that you're looking at me right now, that the flesh is going to be gone. I can't remember which one of y'all said that. I think it was Jared. Um, he uh, asked me what this was. And I think it was him. And I have a little skin tear. It's shaped like a U here. I did it when I was working out on a place the other day. You know what? It was time in my life. I said only old people get those. Well, now that I'm getting them, I either have to acknowledge that I'm getting old, or I can blame it on one of the drugs I'm on. <laughs> so we see, you know, that's, that's aggravating. And, you know, when Donna says I'm vain, I'm not really vain, I'm just conscious of the way I look. And uh, she, I put a band-aid over it before I went to work, and she uh, kind of made fun of me about it. I was like, well, I don't want to get the rest of it sick. <laughs> but uh, that's it, is it not? And you know what? There'll be a day when I'm covered from here to here to here to here with them. And you know why? Because this body is not preserved. This body is going back exactly what it came from. Whether we want to acknowledge that or not, it is what it is, right? But we're getting a better one. If you take me out here and bury me, don't, don't be upset about it. Listen, because I, I have, can you imagine having a body not bent towards sin? Now, I don't know a lot about the heavenly body that we live in. The Bible says that we neither male nor female. I do know that. Be, I mean, I guess the non-gender people finally get what they want, right? Uh, uh, there, there'll be no, there'll be no, but you know what? All that'll be removed so that we can worship God. I know we'll know things we don't know now. Remember in I think it's second Corinthians, maybe further down in, uh, I think it's 2 Corinthians 14. Paul tells of John being called up to the third heaven and seeing things unspeakable to be heard. We'll know that, won't we? You know why you don't know it now? Because this can't take it. We we can't we can't process it. We can't and, and you know what? Uh, sometimes I wonder if some people get so near unto the Lord. And brother over the Lord's side that was preaching at me, he made a good point concerning Elijah, how he was just called up by the Lord. Uh, didn't suffer death the way that we know it, but he was changed, right? Can you imagine someone getting so close to the Lord that they're simply changed? That's what we need. Now, we didn't talk about the walls of jasper or the gates of pearl or the streets of gold that John tells us about. We didn't even mention that. But just the things that we looked at, is that not heaven? It is that not glorious? That's where I, I desire to be. Is it not you? No. That's where, that's where I want to spend eternity. 
just those seven items alone, and one of them is one of them's going to be missing. So really, six items, and Satan not in the picture. You know what that is? That's heaven. That's heaven. Are you going? That's what's critical.